Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. May I introduce uh, first who am I? Uh, I used to be editor in chief of the Standard in Vienna from 1992 to 2007. Since then, I work for this paper as a columnist and moderator, and I'm the publisher of a quarterly. Its name is Phoenix, and it deals with political and cultural phenomena. Um, I may intr introduce the uh, participants in this uh, final discussion of this day. Um, William Horsley is media freedom representative uh, of the Association of European Journalists, correct? correct? Okay. Then we have Barbara Trionfi. We know each other from our work together uh, for several years in the IPI Secretariat in Vienna, the Institute for Press Freedom, where she is um, the Press Freedom manager and uh, travels a lot uh, uh, investigative work mostly so uh, that's the reason why she is on this panel uh, Susanne Scholl is a very important journalist in Vienna because of her background um, she used to be many years uh, a, a correspondent of the Austrian um, TV and radio in Moscow and uh, uh, this engagement is uh, one of the reasons why uh, Austrians are better informed than several other um, than several other countries in the European Union about what is going on in the Eastern Hemisphere. So I am advised to uh, keep some distance to the microphone, which is <laughs> which which is a, a, a difficult uh, lesson for for a journalist. Uh, Costas Arvenitis, correct? Is editor in, is uh, edi editor or journalist in Greece? Which paper? Uh -huh. Okay. Stanka Tosheva is editor in chief of Capital in Bulgaria. And um, Harald Schumann is investigative journalist in. Deutschland speziell, äh, er arbeitet in Berlin für den Tagesspiegel. Ist das richtig? Jawohl. So, I will switch into English or stay in English uh, and do a, a, short, a short summary and interpretation what um, you have heard uh, this day and what, what is in some ways behind uh, the analysis and uh, uh, stories which are told about uh, the, uh, the situation in um, European uh, journalism. Democracy, in my opinion, has become uh, a kind of uh, uh, fashionable, uh, fashionable performance a kind of uh, uh, expression for political events. As a matter of fact, elections, a bomb parliament formally indicate uh, a democracy which even in European countries doesn't function as it should. In fact, elected politicians are no longer the decision makers. Even in many EU uh, 
members of uh, governments are ruled by interests of pressure groups, uh, by uh, influential publishers, uh, and uh, uh, are therefore not the lawyers or controllers of public affairs. The state has to defend, in the opinion of a big industrial complex, has to defend the interests of uh, these companies, has to defend the interests of uh, global players, uh, namely the defense, so-called defense industry. And uh, therefore, surveillance structures, structures are very important and are uh, very influential as they become more and more influential. NSA is only one of them. And last but not least, hand in hand uh, with this phenomenon, dissidents are criminalized not only uh, in uh, former dictatorships, uh, dissidents are um, the, I would say, uh, the controllers who are not uh, longer able to exercise real control. And social medias are infiltrated by intelligence services and uh, the, uh, the story that they support democracy is something which more and more becomes a uh, uh, becomes the same facade than what happens with democracy what i ask the speakers is if possible to look behind these facades and to uh, explain uh, how it has come that democracy is, uh, became weaker and weaker, um, how that could happen, that uh, um, pressure, uh, that pressures and uh, other uh, oppression means are against democratic um, developments and uh, how methods could development which we knew from uh, dictatorships and we saw or we heard some examples from Greece. Mr. Horsley, please. Yeah. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm William Horsley. Um, I work with the Association of European Journalists, which is an independent group and also the Center for Freedom of the Media, which is uh, linked to the University of uh, Sheffield. I was a, a frontline reporter for the BBC for many years, but in recent years, uh, I hope, Mr. Chairman, I will be in a position to help uh, to uh, do what you ask, because I have, uh, like my colleague from the IPI, uh, been very much involved in um, uh, uh, examining the anatomy and uh, the, the reasons behind uh, the kind of symptoms that we heard about uh, this morning, the decline of freedom of expression linked uh, to the weaknesses of uh, democratic uh, government. And what I'm gonna do is to put to you um, a, the, the paradox that, uh, as we all know, uh, the internet has been a, a many thousands time expo ex times explosion in the opportunity for people both to find out information and to express themselves. And yet here we are talking about uh, a new wave and new forms of repression and to a large extent successful repression by states, not just in traditional uh, totalitarian states, but closer and closer to home. I have a quotation uh, here from Paul Starr. He is a Pulitzer Prize winner and a professor at uh, Princeton. The digital revolution, he says, has been good for freedom of expression, uh, increasing the diversity of voices in the public sphere, uh, and it's increased uh, the demands for transparency. But the digital revolution has also weakened 
the freedom of the press. Now, I think that the uh, statistics bear out uh, this surprising conclusion that uh, the freedom of the press is getting weaker. The first reason, of course, is the, uh, in, in, the first symptom is the increase in uh, violence and particularly killing of journalists. The headline uh, is that uh, in 2012, uh, a record number, 121 journalists worldwide uh, were killed. Uh, of course, attacks, abductions, uh, disappearances, torture are also increasing. Uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists uh, does a, a, a survey every year. They say that more journalists are in jail uh, the la in recent years than uh, ever before. Uh, why is this? Well, clearly, uh, we, the, 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 debt, the killings of journalists in conflict zones continues in places like Syria. What's new is a vast swathe of uh, countries from uh, the Philippines uh, through Pakistan to Mexico and South America where uh, in non-conflict zones uh, it's a free-for-all against uh, journalists with uh, corruption of uh, the authorities, uh, very often the judiciary uh, and criminal gangs and uh, other enemies of uh, the press who find that it is very easy to silence uh, uh, those criti critical voices uh, by, by violence or sometimes by simply buying, buying up or co-opting uh, journalists. And so this is corrupted uh, journalism uh, itself. And I would make the point that the, it also points to a, a wider breakdown in the rule of law. What I've observed from doing frequent surveys for the uh, Council of Europe and also for the uh, OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, by the way, this book, the guidebook on safety of journalists by the OSCE will be uh, updated uh, very in, the, in, in, in the next few weeks. That's a little bit of publicity. Uh, what, what I've found is that uh, the, 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 the decline, uh, the, the um, attacks on freedom of expression uh, are very much linked with things like uh, control of uh, elections and uh, this pervasive uh, corruption of the judiciary, uh, which means that very, very few crimes, attacks against journalists worldwide uh, are prosecuted. It is, it is called impunity, and impunity is a great encourager of further uh, attacks. Uh, we see it in in, in the European area, in places like, uh, like Russia, uh, and mu much more widely. In Turkey, uh, now we see the, uh, the government um, moving to control the internet, the new uh, battleground, uh, in effect, uh, and uh, it, there is a picture of a desperate, uh, really weakening, uh, a really pathetic situation of the mainstream media who have been so uh, controlled uh, by uh, the, the, the government apparatus and the owners who are close to the government apparatus, uh, that the public have switched to social media, and, uh, but the social media are not uh, adequate force to hold, hold power to account, as we've, as we've seen. I have one little story for you uh, about freedom of expression, freedom of information. Freedom of information should be, and sometimes is, uh, a fantastic new uh, means to uh, give the public the right to know. And it does uncover corruption. It's, not a, it's no accident that in, in Russia, it is the website of uh, Alexei Navalny, the opposition man, about the anti-corruption website that it had become the, uh, the, the sharpest thorn in the side of, uh, of the Putin uh, uh, machine. The, a the Associated Press uh, Agency ran a very original survey of more than 120 countries around the world uh, asking uh, the state two questions uh, to test freedom of information. The first was how many people in your country have been arrested on anti-terrorism laws since 9-11 and the second uh, how many have been convicted. The results were quite eye-opening. Uh, more than half had no reply or no proper reply <laughs> at all. Mind your own business, was the summary. Um, uh, 
Surprisingly, uh, Belgium and Austria were among those that didn't re reply at all. The US and Canada, according to AP, were almost useless. Uh, uh, so anti-terrorism laws uh, are the key, as we've heard at this conference, to this new, um, uh, this new, the new limitations on, uh, on, on the press, with, the, with states uh, everywhere uh, encroaching on uh, what I would call the, the bedrock of uh, the rules, uh, the agreed set of rules in, in Europe, which has been uh, won by decades of struggle and uh, uh, effort through institutions like the Council of Europe, uh, the European Convention on, on Human Rights, and so on, and which we now see uh, in very grave danger. I'll just suggest, in headline terms, uh, some of the environmental changes which have made possible this new hostile environment. Obviously the technological one, and uh, it's very worrying for journalists in, in Britain, uh, as we were hearing this morning, uh, to, to hear that, to, to, to see the way in which our own uh, political leaders have taken advantage of their monopoly on the old uh, secrecy, the traditional secrecy of the UK, uh, to uh, conceal uh, the operations of the uh, spy agencies uh, and uh, to not to observe uh, due process uh, of law. There are many now, uh, court, many court cases uh, involved in the question of the detention of uh, David Miranda, uh, and, uh, but the, the, uh, as, as we were hearing this morning, uh, reforms are uh, extremely small, sl uh, slow. Um, I think it's worth uh, quoting one uh, ruling from the uh, Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights, going back to the 1970s, uh, which says about surveillance uh, quite clearly that states may not, in the name of uh, efforts against uh, espionage or terrorism, do whatever they, cho they uh, choose, adopt uh, measures that they, may, they, they wish to, on, on, uh, they, they risk, risk undermining or even destroying democracy on the grounds of, uh, of, of defending it. My last point would be precisely that the response, the, the, uh, the future of this debate will depend on the media being vigilant, it'll depend on the public being vigilant and, and caring. There was a, a letter written from uh, Cairo jail by Peter Grest, the uh, Al Jazeera English uh, reporter, and he said, because Egypt had uh, convicted uh, him and uh, several other Al Jazeera journalists on anti-terrorism charges f simply uh, for reporting uh, uh, on the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, he said the only way that this uh, impasse, that this uh, cat catastrophic situation in Egypt uh, can be reversed is by the loud and clear voice of civil society in favour of uh, the rule of law and freedom of expression. I think that's a good motto for us today. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Transform, the University of Vienna, and the organizer of this conference, which is um, wonderfully timely and, and really interesting so far, at least. <laughs> um, we've heard a lot today about the, um, the Snowden affair and the harassment of The Guardian in the UK. Um, maybe not many of you have heard about another development that um, has generated a lot of talk about press freedom in the UK which um, has been the news of the world phone hacking scandal, which led to the Levinson inquiry and eventually um, the so-called Royal Charter on self-regulation of the press as a statutory form of regulation of media ethics, so, so beyond already existing um, and legitimate laws in this area. Um, th this, these developments um, have represented a wake-up call about the state of press freedom in, in Europe, in particular in Western Europe, which is commonly believed to be a, a beacon of press freedom, uh, the, the place where the very idea of press freedom was, bo <coughs> sorry, was born, and, and um, the, the, home, um, the, the, the home continent, if you want, to philosophers such as John Milton, John Stuart Mill, Jürgen Habermas, 
and, and you know the idea of the marketplace, of ideas, the public sphere and so on. This is the Europe we believe we had and, and recent development in the UK, what we just heard about Greece, has been um, eye-opening. Um, in, indeed, we've come a long way in Europe and, and generation and generation of legislators, civil society and social actors uh, with a strong belief um, in the importance of press freedom and freedom of expression has brought about a, a decent um, climate. However, um, behind this uh, surface, which uh, it certainly is, is a very thick surface, uh, um, but behind the surface, the situation is, is bleak. It, it was a combination of factors uh, in the UK, including the revelation of some scandals affecting media credibility, um, a degree of unhealthy competition between media groups, uh, uh, Snowden leaks and the investigation into the Guardian that followed, and all these elements came together to um, and led this uh, thick surface uh, to, to crack. Um, and, and people who are concerned about press freedom started wondering why the UK um, does not include any guarantee for press freedom in its fundamental law, laws um, and whether that shouldn't be uh, necessary. The, the situation in the rest of Europe is not very different. We have, um, indeed, most European countries have constitutions which include guarantees for press freedom, but the, the meaning of these uh, guarantees is greatly diluted by a number of other laws uh, which were specifically passed, many of them decades ago, to restrict free speech, which was long considered a dangerous doctrine. Um, almost everywhere in Europe we have um, criminal laws protecting our heads of state, our royals, and even the public officials from criticism. So we have laws granting special protection to the very people who, as leaders of our democratic system, should be under the greatest scrutiny. Um, and it doesn't end there. We have laws protecting our religions, the religious authorities. We have very strict state secret laws that we have heard this morning, uh, earlier today, with very poor in, uh, public interest, very weak public interest clauses. Um, and, and, and interestingly, as diversity increases across Europe, our government are encouraged not to foster dialogue and exchange between cultures and generate understanding through education, but rather to pass laws, um, so-called hate speech laws, uh, blocking any debate that may involve criticism of minority or majority groups in the society. Um, and we don't need to go very fast to see the absurd consequences of these laws. Here in Austria, only a few weeks ago, um, many of you will have heard about the case of Michael Genner, that's how you pronounce it, the chairman of um, Asyl in Not, uh, which is a Vienna-based uh, Vienna group that advocates for the right of political asylum, and who was charged with endorsing a punishable offense. Uh, the charge stemmed from an article in which um, Ghana expressed support for the work of human smugglers who help refugees fleeing countries uh, thorn by war, terrorism, or religious fundamentalism. Um, and the Austrian Penal Code includes, and the standard has written extensively about it, the Austrian Penal Code includes articles criminalizing the endorsement of an intentionally committed criminal offense if the endorsement offends general perceptions of justice. It's, it, it's a law that it, it basically, I was thinking, you know, um, it, it's a law that blocks, that effectively blocks any democratic debate, uh, questioning the legitimacy of decisions taken by state institutions, uh, which is a basic exercise in any uh, democracy. And um, similar laws exist everywhere across Europe. Um, and I'll give you a couple of uh, Example, interesting example taken from a book on, on hate speech um, laws in Europe by um, a lawyer called Paul Coleman. Um, in 2004, the Swedish pastor Aki Green was sentenced by a district court to one month in prison for preaching a sermon on the biblical teaching against homosexual behavior. Green's offense was expressing contempt or disrespect for a group of people. And in December 2010, Helmut Greece. Um, a 63-year-old man was sentenced to pay 800 euro, it was a settlement, in a fine under section 188 of the Austrian Criminal Code 
for um, offending religious sentiments. His offense was yodeling in his garden, an act that the judge found was an attempt to mock the faith of his Muslim neighbors. This is a um, couple of minutes. <laughs> um, so it, it is, the, the, this is the type of law that we have around Europe, and it's true we haven't used them very much, but still the chilling effect that these laws have on our speech is, is, is immense. The, um, the limitations on free speech in Europe are not uh, limited to these type of things. Indeed, uh, we're, talking about, um, we're talking about imprisonment of journalists. The country that imprisoned the most journalists is Turkey at the moment, 60 journalists in prison on terrorism-related charges. Um, in, in, um, and uh, the big majority of journalists in prison in Turkey, um, some possibly covered issues related to the Kurdish minority, but many of them uh, basically expose wrongdoings of uh, state authorities and happen to belong to the Kurdish minority. So terrorism law were quite uh, useful there to silence um, criticism. Um, we spoke about violence. Violence is not common only in, uh, in, in the Philippines uh, or, or in Mexico. Violence is unfortunately common in Italy. Um, many journalists in Italy work under uh, uh, police protection. Um, and, and, and not only that, I mean, across southern Europe, uh, Corsica, many journalists were, are threatened regularly there. Um, and on a final note, because Europe has been successful in um, convincing the world that, we have, that what we have here is um, democracy at its best, um, the, the, the restrictions on press freedom in Europe become an easy justification for more repressive uh, regimes. Um, this morning, uh, when I was checking my emails, I found in my email, uh, mailbox an appeal by a U.S. American congressman calling on Egypt to free the Al Jazeera journalists currently jailed on terrorism charges. Um, and, and while this is great, the congressman said being a journalist should never be considered a crime. While this is great and we, we welcome these type of appeals, I wonder what is the moral authority of a government like the USA that is the primary promoter of strict anti-terrorism laws and, uh, and the first one who have used such laws beyond their legitimate democratic uh, scope in, our, in order to limit freedom, freedoms. Thank you. Thank you. Ähm, ich spreche Deutsch, ich nehme an, dass doch ein Großteil hier im Saal auch Deutsch kann. Äh, und nachdem das meine Arbeitssprache ist ähm, und mein Englisch lange nicht so gut ist wie Ihres, äh, habe ich mich entschlossen, auf Deutsch zu sprechen. Äh, ich sehe ein bisschen ein Problem äh, bei, in, dieser, in, in der Fragestellung, ob die Demokratie jetzt eine Phase ist oder nicht. Wie wir alle wissen, und ich sage jetzt ganz bewusst, eine Banalität, Demokratie ist etwas, was man sich jeden Tag neu erkämpfen muss, auch die Journalisten. Es gibt auch eine Verantwortung der Journalisten für die Entwicklung der letzten Jahre. Und es gibt etwas, was, was mich besonders irritiert, nämlich eine, eine Art Reizüberflutung, nicht nur für, für die, die Leute im Allgemeinen, also für, für, für die sagen wir mal unter Anführungszeichen normalen Menschen, die einfach ins Internet gehen und dort unglaublich viele Informationen kriegen, die sie nicht verarbeiten können, sondern auch für die Journalisten. Vom Standpunkt der elektronischen Medien, die heutzutage ja doch den größten Einfluss auf das, auf das Publikum und eben auch auf das haben, was man allgemein so als Zivilgesellschaft bezeichnen könnte, ist der Zeitdruck ein solcher, dass man die Masse an Informationen, die man bekommt, eigentlich gar nicht mehr verarbeiten kann. Das gilt nicht nur für die Journalisten, sondern das gilt für alle Menschen. Wir werden wirklich über, absolut überladen mit Informationen und aus denen rauszufiltern, was dann wichtig ist und was nicht, ist kaum noch möglich. Es gibt einen wunderschönen Roman, einen Kriminalroman von der Anne Holt, der heißt die Präsidentin und das ist die Geschichte ganz kurz erzählt. Die erste weibliche amerikanische Präsidentin fährt zum ersten Staatsbesuch 
nach Norwegen, weil sie dort halt irgendeine Vergangenheit hat und wird dort entführt. Und es ist nicht möglich, sie zu finden, also für die Geheimdienste ist es nicht mehr möglich, sie zu finden, weil die haben zwar eine Unmenge an Informationen, aber die eine entscheidende Information, die zu ihren Entführern führen würde, finden sie nicht und sie wird dann zufällig von wem gefunden, der einfach gerade vorbeigeht. Ich glaube, dass das ziemlich deutlich zeigt, in was für einer Gesellschaft wir momentan leben. Und das ist ein Problem, das auch die Journalisten haben. Und äh, wir sind in so einer interessanten Zwickmühle, weil einerseits finden wir, ähm, dass, dass wir, sind wir für Transparenz und wollen, dass Informationen an die Öffentlichkeit kommen, vor allem wenn es um, um Unrecht geht, wenn es um Korruption geht, wenn es um alle diese Dinge geht. Auf der anderen Seite sind wir selber gefangen in dieser in dieser Art von, 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 von Jagd nach immer neuen Informationen äh, und äh, begeben uns in die Situation, dass wir dann eben äh, Leute beschuldigen, äh, auch wenn wir es nicht so genau wissen, weil wir es halt irgendwo lesen und nicht mehr genau wissen, was die Quellen sind, nicht mehr genau wissen, wen man jetzt eigentlich fragen muss, weil alles viel schneller gehen muss, weil so viel kommt, weil alle irgendwie alles wissen und auch nicht. Und äh, im Endeffekt äh, sollten wir uns überlegen, dass, dass die Rolle, die wir als Journalisten haben, nämlich äh, die Informationen auch äh, nicht zu filtern im Sinn von Zensur, aber zu filtern, um zu sehen, was wichtig ist und was nicht, sollten wir eigentlich viel ernster nehmen. Und ich glaube, das ist ein, ein großes Problem und äh, das haben wir alle fast verlernt. Ich nehme mich selber da gar nicht aus. Klar, man geht in der Früh ins Internet und schaut mal, wer was berichtet und dann steht halt da, die Krim hat sich gerade von der Ukraine abgespaltet und dann ist man furchtbar entsetzt und stellt dann fest, dass das nicht ganz so ist, dass halt ein bisschen was anderes passiert ist, aber da inzwischen ist die Meldung schon draußen. Und wir reden darüber, dass jetzt auf der Krim der Krieg ausbricht. Und äh, machen damit etwas, was ich auch, wo ich den Ausdruck auch nur auf Englisch kenne, nämlich eine Art self-fulfilling prophecy. Und das finde ich, äh, das, das finde ich, ist, ist wirklich, sollte heutzutage unser Hauptthema sein. Dankeschön. Danke schön. Um, I may add, uh, may add one One uh, uh, problematic uh, development within media, this is a so-called block journalism and uh, uh, the Bürgerjournalismus of Deutsch. Um, it is very much favored by publishers and media tycoons because uh, bloggers and uh, uh, Journalists from the street are much cheaper than professional journalists and when making money it's of course not the point of quality, it is the point of cash. And this is one of the very, very dangerous developments uh, in uh, our uh, situation at the moment. Uh, the next speaker is um, our Greek friend Kostas Arvanitis. Θα σα μιλήσω στη γλώσσα μου, μια και η γλώσσα βάλετε, αλλά και η χώρα που βάλετε και θα σα παρακολουθήσω να φορέσετε τα κουστικά σα. Με πολύ μεγάλο ενδιαφέρον παρατηρώ τι ενδιαφέρει τοποθετήσει των συναδέλφων και με έφεραν πολλά χρόνια πίσω. Ήταν οι προβληματισμοί που είχαμε εμεί πριν η χώρα μπει στο μνημόνιο. Αυτά ήταν ακριβώ τα θέματα που ζητούσαμε τότε. Όμω, εγώ ήρθα εδώ πιο πολύ να σα μεταφέρω την εικόνα που ζούμε σήμερα. Και αν συμφωνήσετε στο τέλο, ενδεχομένω να συμφωνήσουμε ότι έχουμε πολύ μεγάλη ανάγκη της υποστήριξής σας. Αν είναι εδώ η συνάδελφος από τον Guardian, πρέπει να τη συστηθώ. Είμαι ο δημοσιογράφος, ένας εκ των δύο, 
που η εκπομπή του κόπτηκε στη δημόσια ραδιοτηλεόραση σε αυτό που ανέφεραν οι συνάδελφοι από το Unfollow όταν 6 και 3 πρώτα λεπτά ώρα Ελλάδας επαναφέραμε στη δημόσια τηλεόραση στην ΕΡΤ τότε το, το έγγραφο του ιατροδικαστή ότι οι άνθρωποι που συνελήφθησαν χτυπήθηκαν βάναυσα στη Γενική Αστυνομική Διεύθυνση της Αθήνας και το σχόλιο ήταν αν ο κύριος Δένδιας θα κάνει τελικά μήνυση στο Guardian ή θα παραιτηθεί. Αν θυμάστε, τότε η εκπομπή κόπτηκε στον αέρα, ήταν η πρωινή εκπομπή της ΕΡΤ. Ένα μεγάλο ποστό τηλεθέασης, νομίζω ήταν εκείνη την εποχή, ήταν η δεύτερη εκπομπή σε τηλεθέαση στην Ελλάδα. Μετά από λίγο καιρό έκλεισε και η ΕΡΤ. Θα ήθελα λίγο λοιπόν να σας πω την ιστορία, όχι τη δική μου ιστορία, αλλά τη δική μας ιστορία στην Ελλάδα, διότι τίποτα δεν είναι τυχαίο. Τα πάντα λένε ότι στη χώρα μας άλλαξαν από τη στιγμή που η χώρα μπήκε στο μνημόνιο. Τα πάντα όμως είχαν αλλάξει χρόνια πριν, όταν άλλαζε το παραγωγικό μοντέλο της χώρας. Σας θυμίζω ότι η χώρα μου ήταν αυτή που χειροκροτήθηκε το 2004 όταν έκανε την Ολυμπιάδα. Σας θυμίζω ότι η χώρα μου εκείνη την εποχή μπήκε στην Οικονομική Νομισματική Ένωση. Θυμίζω ότι εκείνη την εποχή, με τον Πρωθυπουργό Σιμίτη, η χώρα άλλαζε παραγωγικό μοντέλο ανάπτυξης. Και για αυτή την αλλαγή βεβαίως και ευθύνη και γνώση είχαν οι εταίροι και συνεταίροι στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση. Θέλω να σας πω ακόμα ότι στην Ελλάδα είχαμε ε, τους παραδοσιακούς εκδότες. Και όπως είπαμε πολύ σωστά νωρίτερη συναδελφοί μου, από τον follow αυτά άλλαξαν όταν στο χώρο των μέσων μαζικής ενημέρωσης μπήκαν εργολάβοι και άνθρωποι της πιάτσας, της δουλειά. Σήμερα οι άνθρωποι αυτοί ουσιαστικά ελέγχονται αποκλειστικά από τις τράπεζες. Οι τράπεζες ελέγχονται απόλυτα από την Τρόικα. Σήμερα η Τρόικα τροφοδοτεί το μοναδικό τομέα με χρήμα των Ευρωπαίων πολιτών και των Ελλήνων λιμοκτονούντων πολιτών τα μέσα μαζικής ενημέρωσης. Αν θεωρεί κάποιος ότι αυτό δεν είναι ασυστημένο σε και παιχνίδι, τότε νομίζω ή εθεροτυφλή ή ουσιαστικά έχει άλλη πολιτική θέση από αυτή τη δημοκρατία. Θέλω ακόμα να σας μεταφέρω ότι πριν κλείσει η ΕΡΤ, θα μπορούσε ένα αυστριακός εδώ να φανταστεί ότι κάποια στιγμή μια κυβέρνηση θα πει «κλείνω τη δημόσια ραδιοτηλεόραση» ή δεν ξέρω μπορείτε να το φανταστείτε. Εμάς μας συνέβη αυτό. Με διάγγελμα. Λοιπόν, εμείς επειδή... Εγώ ήρθα να μεταφέρω εδώ τη δικιά μου εικόνα και εσείς θα κρίνετε τι θα κάνετε αν το ακροδεξιό σας κόμμα κάνει αυτή την κίνηση. <Κι> Ήθελα μόνο λίγο να κλείσω την ιστορία για να πω δύο λόγια που προλάβω και για, τα, για το θέμα αυτό καθεαυτό. Οι συχνότητες στην Ελλάδα, όταν έκλεισε η ΕΡΤ, που ήταν ο μεσολαβητής ουσιαστικά, ο δημόσιος, ήταν το δημόσιο, ο δημόσιος εγγυητής της διαδικασίας, η κυβέρνηση έκλεισε την ΕΡΤ, πέταξε ουσιαστικά έξω αυτόν που θα διαχειριζόταν εκ μέρους του ελληνικού δημοσίου τη διαδικασία και οι ιδιώτες από μόνοι τους μοιράσαν τις συχνότητες. Δεύτερο ζήτημα. Η ΕΡΤ ήταν ουσιαστικά το τελευταίο τους άλοθη. Κλείνοντα την ΕΡΤ, αφού έχουν προχωράσει, προχωρήσει διάφορε κινήσει, κλείνοντα την ουσιαστικά, απέδειξαν και είπαν στου Έλληνε πολίτε ότι δεν έχουν ανάγκη ούτε τα άλλα. Θέλω να σα πω ότι όλοι εμεί που, ή πολλοί από εμά οι οποίοι απολυθήκαμε, φύγαμε, εκδιωχθήκαμε από την ΕΡΤ, εκτό εμού, θα σα πω που εργάζομαι, είναι σήμερα άνεργοι. Κανένα από του 4-5 καναλάρχε δεν θεώρησε ότι ήταν αξιόλογα προϊόντα αυτά. Είναι μια πραγματική ιστορία φήμωσης που συμβαίνει σήμερα στην Ελλάδα. 
Θέλω να σας πω ότι όπως ακούσαμε ιστορίες εδώ από, το, από τους συναδέλφους και από τη συνάδελφο πριν, ότι η αστυνομία, οι δημοσιογράφοι πάνε πολλές φορές κοντά στην αστυνομία για να προστατευτούν, για να κάνουν τη δουλειά τους. Στην Ελλάδα, οι δημοσιογράφοι χτυπιούνται από την αστυνομία όταν κάνουν τη δουλειά τους. Θέλω να σας θυμίσω ότι ο πρόεδρος των φωτορεπόρτερ, ο κύριος Λόλος, ήταν στην εντατική μετά από χτυπήματα των δυνάμεων καταστολής, όταν φωτογράφιζε τις εξελίξεις στην πλατεία συντάγματος. Συνάδελφός μου έχει μείνει κουφός. Θέλω να σας πω ακόμα ότι στις ιστορίες αυτές κλείνοντας, mm -hmm. μου λένε να τελειώσω, κλείνω. Θέλω να σας πω λοιπόν ακόμα ότι ιστορίες καθημερινές εκφασισμού ουσιαστικά της κοινωνίας ζουν και προσπαθούν οι δημοσιογράφοι στην Ελλάδα να κάνουν τη δουλειά τους. Ό,τι γίνεται στην Ελλάδα, το οποίο φωτογραφίζει μια άλλη πραγματικότητα από αυτή που παράγουν τα μέσα μαζικής ενημέρωσης και τα blogs, τα οποία είναι πολλά εκ των οποίων είναι στα χέρια ιδιωτών, θεωρούνται ΣΥΡΙΖΑ. Όποιος βλέπει διαφορετικά την είδηση είναι ΣΥΡΙΖΑ. Το αυτονόητο στην Ελλάδα μπορεί να θεωρηθεί ΣΥΡΙΖΑ. Ο τεν, τεν στην Ελλάδα θα ήταν άνεργος και φίλος του Τσίπρα, διότι θα ήταν ΣΥΡΙΖΑ. Αυτή την τρέλα ζούμε στην Ελλάδα. Σήμερα. Τέλος θέλω να σας πω, θα μπορούσατε να φανταστούτε ότι μέσα στην κυβέρνησή σας, στο Υπουργείο Τύπου, αν έχετε εδώ, ή στο κυβερνητικό μέγαρο, θα υπήρχε μια ομάδα αλήθεια, η οποία θα τροφοδοτεί τα μίντια για την αλήθεια της κυβέρνηση. Είναι αυτό ευρωπαϊκή χώρα. Αυτό είναι το ευρωπαϊκό κεκτημένο. Αυτά είναι τα ζητήματα που σήμερα, εκτός από τα ελλείμματα, οφείλουν να δουν. Σήμερα εγώ εργάζομαι σε ένα ραδιόφωνο που λέγεται στο κόκκινο. Red Radio. Το ραδιόφωνο αυτό είναι το μοναδικό ραδιόφωνο σήμερα σε εθνική συχνότητα, το οποίο προσπαθεί να δώσει τις άλλες ειδήσει. Οι άλλες ειδήσει είναι κλείνοντα. Είναι μια διαδήλωση που θα γίνει και θα τη δείξει κανείς. Είναι μια διαμαρτυρία που θα γίνει και θα τη δείξει κανείς. Είναι ένας άνθρωπος που αυτοκτονεί και δεν το λέει κανείς. Και θεωρούν ότι οι 5.000 άνθρωποι που έχασαν τη ζωή τους στην Ελλάδα έχουν πεθάνει από έρωτα. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. The team was stopped by the police while filming property of Gelian Paevsky. For those of you unfamiliar with his name, he is a very controversial politician with a notorious reputation. Uh, I need to often clarify here that as well as having a fortune with unclear origin, he is often seen the epitome of the biggest problem that Bulgaria faces. Not only total lack of separation of executive, legislative and judicial powers, but their total subordination to a small circle of people described as the oligarchy. Uh, only one example. Uh, he's the same time, he, uh, twice he was elected to a member of parliament, and at the same time uh, he was served as a prosecutor, and at uh, the same time, he was one of the largest business owners in the country and all for media mogul, holding a monopoly over the Bulgarian press market. That's precisely why, why his appointment as a director of the Agency for National Security in the middle of June last year was the cause of the mass citizen protests, which in various forms continue to this day. 
But let's go back to the incident with Arti. A police car uh, was sent immediately to the property where the team from the channel was filming. The police stopped their car and asked the local video operator whom they had hired for an ID. Minutes later, his boss called him and told him to immediately delete the footage and not give any of it to the journalists from Arti. Uh, this incident was reported not uh, only in uh, our newspaper and some uh, uh, in a couple of other independent news websites. The uh, newspapers and websites which on paper belongs to the mother of this person, but in, rea in reality are his, immediately began a campaign, accused the European channel in fulfilling uh, someone's order to discredit him. Uh, this allegation ignored the fact that uh, the report from Marty did not break any journalistic or ethical norms and standards. What makes this case important is the fact that it is not only an isolated incident, but a practice relating to lack of media freedom in Bulgaria. Uh, this practice does not only affect Bulgarian media, but it affects media in other EU countries. Another example is the case from September last year when uh, Pevsky conglomerate named New Bulgarian Media Group and caused uh, a similar scandal threatening to sue the German state broadcaster Deutsche Welle. The threats came after the Bulgarian service of Deutsche Welle a report about the influence that uh, this person and his group have on government decisions. The example with Arte perfectly illustrates not only the problems with the current media environment in Bulgaria, but also uh, the situation how uh, instances or, uh, of abuse of political power and state security services, which are being asked to directly intervene in journalist work. This incident also illustrates how a large proportion of the media in Bulgaria act as a convenient instrument in the hand of the governing coalition, currently between three parties, one of which is ultra-nationalist. Uh, it's not a coincidence that those media are often referred to as the baseball bats for the powers that be. This analogy comes from the early years of Bulgarian transition when criminal groups used to racketeer everyone with the help of baseball bats. All of this can explain why investigative journalism has almost ceased to exist when it comes to people with power and when it comes to investigating the problematic process that protesters now refer to as puppeteering in mafiaization of the state. That's uh, how people describe manipulating the government behind the scene in non-transparent decision making. Uh, I'm talking about process, not a single occurrence, because the media outlets from New Bulgarian Media Group provides comfort and positive coverage to the previous government too. Uh, this affects pluralism of opinion, although pluralism is hardly present in a country with such strong concentration of ownership. Newspapers, TV channels, and websites. Uh, for those media, journalistic standards in practice do not exist. What is more, the same media group holds the monopoly in, in distribution of, of newspapers throughout the country, which makes the situation that I have been describing even more sinister. For, to a large proportion of uh, other uh, publishers, this monopoly can be fatal. Finally, the true ownership of the majority of those media. Um, I want uh, to tell you that uh, the media in Bulgaria were the uh, engine that drove the democratic changes in Bulgaria. Now, quarter of a century after the collapse of communism and seven years, into EU membership, the crisis is striking. There are several, several reasons for this. Among them are media concentration, unclear ownership, lack of criteria for access of state in European, European funding. Uh, economic, uh, economic and political dependency, lack of effective regulation or self-regulation.
And only one fact. Uh, according to a very recent uh, national survey, survey about uh, the media environment in Bulgaria during last year, only 13.5% uh, of Bulgarians believe that the media are independent. <laughs> Our last speaker is Harald uh, Schumann. Er wird uh, ein bisschen anschließen an das, was Susanne Scholl um, angesprochen hat, uh, namely the uh, contribution of uh, journalists themselves to the deteriorating uh, quality of press freedom. Um, Mr. Schumann, please. No, um, I'm not an investigative journalist. I do not like this term because everybody in our profession who is doing his job properly still is now dubbed an investigative journalist. Um, check your sources, yeah, go for double sources, check the figures, try to find out what the other side says and if you do all this, immediately you are dubbed an investigative journalist. Um, so, what I, if I have to call me a certain type of journalist, I would call me an analytic journalist, because usually I work with publicly available data and information. Um, it's available but not used. And that's my topic here. Um, so far in all the stories, except what Susanna told us, um, the journalists are the heroes. Yeah? They work against the sinister forces and um, they have to, to, to come up against repression from state and police and all this is true and it happens. But let's be honest, 95% of all of our profession do not have this problem. They have quite other problems. For example, in Germany, the, the whole character of our profession has completely changed in the last decade. When I started my career 30 years ago, to be a journalist was sort of an exotic profession. I remember quite well when I finished my studies with a diploma in engineering, um, my parents and, and friends uh, told me, you want to be a journalist? You have a degree, an, an academic degree, don't you want to, to make something serious? Um, and when I started my career, the salary was really quite small, quite, quite very, very little money in the beginning. But I knew I had a good chance when I'm good and when I learned to, to research and write on a professional level, I will make my living. And, and so it came. Today, the situation is completely the opposite. To become a journalist or to work in, the media, in, in, in media has become fashionable, has become trendy. Every year more young people leave the university and the media schools with a degree in journalism and every year the available decent jobs are more are little. There, is not, there are not enough jobs for all those who want to become journalists. The result is the abundance of journalists who want to become one and this is exploited by by the editors by tv stations by radio stations to make young applicants work 60 hours per week and according to a recent study done in by, by the university in hamburg um, for an average uh, wage of 3.80 cent euros hourly wage, 60 hours a week. This is the situation. And what do they do when they work on this level? Yeah? They do one or two stories per day. So it is impossible to work properly. It is impossible to do research. And what has become the norm in journalism is simple affirmative reporting. So you might say, so what? 
aren't there still thousands of hungry, critical journalists doing their stories, not being afraid of the risk, and so on? Yes, there are. And still we have some quality media, the New York Times, The Guardian, in Germany, Der Spiegel, or Süddeutsche Zeitung. But are we really good informed? Unfortunately not, because the number of journalists who really can still do their job good has diminished a lot. It has declined. Take, for example, the Euro crisis, which is my striking example. Um, if you ask a regular consumer of German or French or Dutch or Austrian quality media, what is the Euro crisis about? The answer will be, well, these people, these governments in the crisis countries, they have borrowed too much and spent too much. And uh, so we had to rescue them and, and to give them additional money. And we have saved them from bankruptcy, so they should be, should be grateful. That's what 99% of German media consumers think. Everybody who has only basic knowledge in economics knows that each trade always has two sides. So if these countries, these governments, the banks there have borrowed too much, there must be somebody who has lent too much. Who was it? Interestingly, this question has never been put in German media. Until today, I can name only five reports in five years who have put this question. And it takes you 10 minutes to look at the figures of the Bank of International Settlements to find out that it were German banks and French banks and British banks who were the main investors in the, in the crisis countries. And in another 30 minutes later, by checking the websites of the EU Commission, you will find out that more than 90% of all the so-called rescue credits have been used to pay out these investors in spite of them having made very bad investments. Do you think one of those great German journalists had ever asked our politicians who are the beneficiaries of the bailout programs? Imagine for a moment if this would have been done from the beginning of the Euro crisis and the German voters, the German media consumers would have learned that every single sent they, their taxpayers' money spent in Greece, in Ireland, in uh, Portugal, in Cyprus, is being used to pay out their fellow wealthy compatriots in Germany who have made bad investments. If everybody would have known from the beginning of the Euro crisis that this is the core business of all these rescue programs, we would have had a completely different debate. We would have discussed why every German taxpayer has to take the risk for the very few wealthy investors in the crisis countries who were also Germans. And maybe the, probably the political outcome would have been completely different. Yeah, we would have come up with an additional temporary wealth tax or something like that to compensate yeah, for this bailout of the investors. Why do I explain, why do I tell you this example? Because it's so striking that as soon as the interests of the wealthy elite is affected, all this great German journalism does not work anymore. And all these investigative journalists do not put the question, why do it, why they do it? Because when you start as a young journalist to put these questions, you make very bad experiences. Suddenly, the superiors are no longer interested in your work. Suddenly, the editors call you, can't you switch to another issue? And so on. And the reason behind is, there come letters. Letters from CEOs, from lobbyists, from politicians, not to the affected journalists themselves, but to the editors. And the editors are dependent on the, on the advertisement budgets. This is the very subtle, but very effective mechanism of censorship, which it works at least in German media, I suppose it's not much different in other countries, but I know the situation in Germany. 
And that's what I've lived in Der Spiegel for 10 years. That's the reason why I've left. And to give you an, an, an example, now I'm one of the very happy few who has an editor who has a real liberal consciousness. And he has received one of those letters after I had written an essay in our paper um, mentioning that Deutsche Bank has sold foul um, securities, knowingly has sold foul securities to its German customers, which have been bailed out by the German state, the EKB Bank. This is a fact proven by the United States Senate, so it was by, by no means uh, uh, a scoop or something like that, you know, it was a, a known fact. But the director of public relations of Deutsche Bank wrote to my editor that it's all nonsense and unproven and so on, and the last sentence of this one and a half page letter was, and we Sorry, how do you translate it? We uh, we we expect, we expect from you that in future such a kind of an article will not be published anymore in your paper. Uh, you know, just by chance, I had the possibility to read such a such a letter. I am hundred percent sure there are lots of this kind of letters arriving at the editors in chief at at the publisher's house of which the, the ordinary journalists never know. They never learn that this has happened. What they learn is that they are asked to switch a bit to other issues or to make it less radical or to not put all the time the same questions of which they don't get the answer and so on and so on. And this in combination with the precarious situa economic situation of most younger journalists means that all this talk about critical and investigative journalism is just a dream. It's a drop in the ocean of the whole media stream. And the whole media stream is directed in one way or the other by the hidden interests of corporate, um, of corporations, banks, and their organizations. I think this, this, at least in the Western countries, in the wealthy industrialized countries, is the main problem of the press freedom we have. Thank you. And that's one of the reasons why possibly we will have several or many years of crisis still before us. Because it, it favors the rich and it puts the blame on the uh, mass tax players and uh, payers and uh, uh, the ordinary people. Um, uh, questions from the audience, please. We have still 20 minutes, so possibly one, 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 one question or one statement. Yes. Θα παρακαλούσα να συμπληρώσω κάτι και για τους συναδέλφους εδώ. Νομίζω ότι θα έχει μία αξία για τη δουλειά. Επαναλαμβάνω. Στην Ελλάδα το πρόβλημα δεν είναι σήμερα ότι έχεις διαφορετική εκτίμηση των δεδομένων ή των γεγονότων. Το θέμα στην Ελλάδα σήμερα είναι να μην μπει στην, μην μπει στην είδηση. Το βασικό θέμα στη χώρα σήμερα είναι μην αλλάξει την ατζέντα. Αυτό τα προβλήματα που είπε ο συνάδελφο σήμερα, επαναλαμβάνω, με έφεραν στα ωραία χρόνια της προηγούμενης πενταετίας. Σήμερα το θεματολόγιο κόβεται και ράβεται στα πέντε θέματα που θέλουν οι τέσσερις εκδότες, που θέλουν αυτοί που έχουν τα τέσσερα τηλεοπτικά κανάλια και η κυβέρνηση. Χαλκιδική θέμα δεν υπάρχει, απεργία θέμα δεν υπάρχει, αυτοκτορημένος δεν υπάρχει. Μιλάμε γι' αυτό. Αυτό είναι πάρα πολύ σοβαρό. Και το Τοποθετώ και το βάζω στην κουβέντα αυτή για προβληματισμό προ όλου. Στην ατζέντα. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, May I just answer? Yeah, yeah. My, you know, my 
statement was only complementary to what you said. Of course, I know the situation is Greece, in Greece is much worse than ours in Germany. But if we don't achieve to overcome the hidden economic interests in, the, in our media business, we will sooner or later arrive where you already are. That's my fear. OK. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to collect three questions or short statements and then return to the podium to uh, create the possibility for the speakers to answer because of lack of time. Uh, so the lady in the last uh, row, I think it is, one question. Yes, please. And uh, if possible, please introduce yourself. It's possible. <laughs> um, my name is Christina Mueller. I'm an independent, uh, I guess, communication specialist. I was a journalist for many years in several parts of the world. Um, I'm from Brazil originally, but I also worked for the Associated Press and for Reuters and for Brazilian publications in the Middle East and Africa and here in Europe. Um, I, I just wanted to say that a lot of the times, uh, over, the, over the last few years when I've been reading a lot about freedom of information under pressure, I'm reminded of things that I went through as a young journalist, and I think there was a lot of pressure on freedom of information, uh, especially in Brazil and reporting from Africa um, and the Middle East, definitely. And I think the, the woman who was talking about Russia, I, I'm sure she, fall, she, you know, she falls into the category of journalists who were pressured, who were under intensive pressure for many years, um, you know, in the Eastern Bloc. So. I, I, get, I think I have a little bit of a feeling of deja vu with all this, yeah? And, uh, and I find it a little bit boring, to tell you the truth, yeah? I, find, <laughs> I think it would be more useful, yeah, if, um, if, uh, if everybody were talking about um, a few more solutions and, and, perhaps, um, uh, and perhaps would actually admit to themselves, especially the press, that we got caught in a trap of, of being um, almost like nouveau riche, you know? Um, you know, here we were, the poor media, you know, like the colleague from Germany was saying, you know, the poor media, you know, you graduate from somewhere and then you, you know, you have a low salary and then suddenly you get a big salary and, uh, and everybody's really enchanted that they're a journalist and that they're, the, you know, the state of the art and the artists and the, you know, and, and everybody's looking at you like you're a big uh, celebrity type person. And the fact is that, um, that the media convinced itself that there was that you, they could sweep all the problems of the world under the rug, and it didn't have to face you know issues that which is heavy to face now. I don't okay. know. I just, uh, that's 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 just. I just wanted to say that I think this there is a feeling of déjà vu, and uh, and I don't really think that this is really that new in humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman in the one, two, three, four, fourth row. Yeah. Hi. My name is Mata Simsalha. I am from um, the University of Manchester. I'm doing a PhD in Middle Eastern Studies. I want to ask a question to the uh, gentleman and lady who mentioned Al Jazeera. And if I understood correctly, you said that uh, the journalists in Al Jazeera, they were convicted merely because they are reporting on the Muslim Brotherhood. Is that correct? Uh, not convicted, but uh, arrested. Arrested, because they are reporting on the Muslim Brotherhood. And my question is, why didn't the Egyptian authority arrested ABC journalists or uh, CNN or any other uh, media journalists? How, you know, where did you get this idea from? Okay, thank you. Uh, an additional question, obviously here to the right. Not? No question? Thank you. No. Yes, yes. Here, yeah. Good evening, my name is Marina Delcev. I'm from the Biba magazine. We all agree that freedom of media goes hand in hand with um, economical freedom and independence. Um, but we give a lot of our work to our, our readers for free. On the other hand, we want to be dependent on 
public money or um, on revenues of advertising. So has anyone on the podium or an idea or a vision of how media companies could work in future without being too dependent on companies and governments and not paying their young journalists three euro eighty per hour? Okay, and uh, last question, the gentleman here, yes. Yeah, my name is Christoph, I'm a student here at the university, but I've also been a blogger for more than a decade. Um, it kind of aligns with what um, the previous question was asking. I've been hearing a lot of complaints about different areas and things that aren't working. I mean, for you as a panel, what are some of the possible solutions? Not just economic models, but what could the future of freedom of information and media look like? Thanks. Thank you very much. So, final comments uh, from the speakers, and I would like to uh, ask Mr. Horsley for a comment. Thank you very much. I'll be brief. But uh, on Al Jazeera, uh, the charge sheet did uh, specifically say that these journalists were uh, arrested and charged. Uh, because their, um, th their dealings, including reporting and contact with uh, people from the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, uh, was uh, against national security. There were also some rather obviously trumped up uh, charges about uh, having falsified uh, the uh, images or the news reports. And the defense of uh, Al Jazeera against the charges was precisely that uh, the fact that we covered the Muslim Brotherhood and, and its people does not mean that does not mean that we necessarily sympathise with them. So that was the the core issue, um, and uh, the, the the broader point about that is that this conflation, uh, confusion between journalists possessing information or using information about sensitive groups or or, or groups which are opposed to the authorities, uh, to to turn that into a charge of terrorism is becoming more common. It's also more common unfortunately in Turkey, and uh, we've begun to see that in the UK as well, which is very distressing. Because the, uh, the question of the, the, the um, uh, excellent question about the corruption of journalism itself, uh, I think you might be interested to, to, to know that in uh, the UK, uh, The Guardian um, is now, of course, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, a, a, a vitally important champion of media freedom uh, worldwide. But at home in the UK, it has many enemies within the powerful media. Uh, there is a background uh, to this because, of course, it was the Guardian that exposed the, uh, the, the phone hacking and uh, the, the, the bad, uh, the bad uh, behavior uh, inside the Murdoch uh, group uh, and uh, is, al is also uh, very much, well, it's, it's, it's a, it's a left-right split, uh, if you like. But they, they've been very bold. They, their, their reporter, Nick Davis, uh, wrote a book uh, called Flat Earth News, which precisely made the point that the vast number, maybe majority, of stories that appear in mainstream newspapers are regurgitated. They are recycled or they're based on, on PR. So that is, uh, I completely agree with you, the real uh, journalism. What I would say in passing is that in the UK, the tabloid press have rightly been uh, attacked, have been uh, uh, shown uh, to be shameful in the way they behaved. But the, my idea is that the reality in the UK of these um, impertinent, uh, annoying uh, tabloid journalists, this is one reason why democracy is alive in the UK. Uh, they ask the difficult questions, they push the boundaries, and very often it is the establishment papers who, who go with the establishment politicians, uh, for example, with the new uh, regulation system which is being proposed. So long live difficult journalism. And it's, uh, in, uh, in some ways it's a shame that uh, the courage is not responded by the, by the uh, uh, readership. The circulation is not going up. The Guardian's circulation is not going up, and uh, and the readers uh, are not uh, 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 able to to see or not willing to see uh, this courage. In yes, 
just to add, uh, to, to me, uh, well, you, you may be right about that. The important thing is that so many of the mainstream media in the UK have chosen to take the side of the security state over the Snowden issue. And many of them have written editorials saying that The Guardian is a, is a danger to national security uh, or uh, is a traitor, uh, this kind of thing, which is, uh, which is to, my, to my mind, extremely shocking. Uh, but it, it, it shows uh, how deep these polarizations are in many countries, including the UK. So this lack of civil awareness, civic awareness in the UK is a puzzle. It is a problem. Uh, but the questions are being asked. I believe that uh, in, in, in t with time, uh, the civil society will come to understand these uh, dangers, dangers better because that is the, the British tradition. But my final sentence is, you know, there are remedies. The, the lady who asked the question is right. There are remedies. Uh, we, it, it, to make the Freedom of Information uh, Act work, to have independent regulators, uh, to, uh, to, to have conflict of interest uh, laws, to prevent this fusion of political power and media power, which we've seen, uh, to hold back the demons of authoritarianism. All these things, these possibilities exist, but we need courage. We need courage from our societies. We need courage from our governments. My last sentence is, the UK has disappointed hugely by adopting a position towards the European Convention on Human Rights saying that national uh, parliaments and national laws should in many cases override the agreed rules of the European Convention. This is giving cover, it's giving camouflage to countries like Russia and Turkey. They just say, we, that's what we think, we're just following the example of the UK. It's a dangerous path. Barbara? Um. Thank, thank you. With regard to the um, Al Jazeera question, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I would repeat what William, William has said. I mean, the facts are there and uh, there are excellent articles are there, out there about um, confusion between journalists and um, terrorists. Uh, there is enough uh, literature about it and I think Egypt is a typical case in, in, in this specific case. Um, with regard to um, it is true, we have been discussing the same issues for many years. It's not a deja vu, it is true, because we don't have a solution, because a solution has yet to be found. Uh, we believe that we could have had a solution in, um, um, in online news media being possibly uh, a cheaper way of, uh, and a more uh, accessible way for, for the broad audience. Uh, um, but it is true that not news media is also still looking for a way to uh, sell its news online. Um, some, um, some newspaper that produce what we call public interest news, I mean, everything which is not gossips and, and so on, have found other ways of funding some excellent, uh, for example, the IPI will give an award to a newspaper called Al Monitor, which is funded by a foundation, by a, by a what in, in German is called a Stiftung. Um, it is one way. Is it an ideal way? Um, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a way. Some, some people have, have tried to look other ways. There are certain, um, I, I know newspaper owners in, um, in, in Africa, for example, uh, that have completely separate uh, business to support their uh, newspaper. And, and there is no interference. That business, which is making money, is just supporting the news business. It's not, it's, again, I don't think it's an ideal solution. I don't think we have one so far. Uh. Καταρχήν στο κομμάτι, διαφωνώ μαζί σας. Αν δηλαδή, λέω στην κυρία που είπε ότι δεν μάθαμε τίποτα καινούριο, αν αυτά που ακούσατε ή τουλάχιστον αυτά που μετέφερα από τη χώρα μου ή από το αμφόλου οι συνάδελφοι να ξέρετε και δεν σας έκαναν τίποτα, τότε νομίζω ότι έχουμε σοβαρό θέμα επικοινωνία. Το θέμα που βάζετε και όπως ακούστηκα, δεν είναι τεχνικό πρόβλημα. Έχετε καμιά λύση για να υπάρχει ο τύπος. Τεχνικό είναι το πρόβλημα ή πολιτικό είναι το πρόβλημα. Ποιε είναι οι αρχέ, οι θεσμοί που καθορίζουν σήμερα τη λειτουργία του τύπου, την ελευθερία των δημοσιογράφων, δεξιών αριστερών, αναρχικών, χριστιανών, μουσουλμάνων. Αυτό είναι το μεγάλο ερώτημα σήμερα. Ποιο είναι αυτό που καθορίζει το τι είναι η είδηση και τι δεν είναι. Στο πρώτο κομμάτι, λοιπόν, είναι αυτή η απάντησή μου. Σήμερα η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση και η Ευρώπη έχει σοβαρό πολιτικό θέμα. 
Και όσοι δημοσιογράφοι το βλέπουν ω τεχνικό πρόβλημα, νομίζω ότι κάνουν πολύ μεγάλο λάθο. Και ουσιαστικά, χωρί να το θέλουν, συμμαχούν με τον αντίπαλο, που είναι αυτό που θέλει να φημώσει την είδηση. Η ομορφιά τη είδηση είναι η οπτική των ανθρώπων. Αλλά υπάρχει είδηση. Στη χώρα μου πνίγεται η είδηση. Αυτό σα είπα. Στο δεύτερο κομμάτι, αν υπάρχουν ιδέε. Εγώ είμαι διευθυντή των 105 και 5 ραδιοφωνικών σταθμό στο Κόκκινο. Ήταν ένα μικρό ραδιόφωνο. Σήμερα, μετά από αρκετό καιρό και προσπάθεια, ένα καλά και μεγάλο ραδιόφωνο. Ο ιδιοκτήτη είναι ο ΣΥΡΙΖΑ. Αυτό έγινε διότι δεν υπήρχε άλλο τρόπο ουσιαστικά να εκφραστεί μια άλλη αντίληψη. Το στοίχημα είναι αν θα είναι ραδιόφωνο του ΣΥΡΙΖΑ ή θα είναι ραδιόφωνο ελεύθερο, ανεξάρτητο, με αριστερή οπτική βεβαίω, αλλά θα αναπνέουν όλα τα λουλούδια. Φαίνεται το πείραμα πάει. Και στο επιχειρηματικό κομμάτι. Αυτό που κάνουμε εμεί, μια ιδέα είναι τα παιδιά από το Αμφόλο, θα μπορούσα να σα πω. Στο κομμάτι των εφημερίδων. Αν κάνει μία εφημερίδα ένα ευρώ, ένα μισή ευρώ, εμείς έχουμε δύο εκατομμύρια ανέργους. Πού θα βρούμε τους καταναλωτές. Στο, στο δικό μας κομμάτι κάνουμε συνέργειες. Με ομάδες όπως είναι το Alter Thess, μπλοκ της Θεσσαλονίκης, με ομάδα πολιτών και εμείς. Και πιστεύω θα τα καταφέρουμε. Να μια λύση. Ich denke, Sie haben schon recht, es gibt ein gewisses Déjà-vu und Journalisten jammern immer darüber, wie es Ihnen geht und sagen immer, dass alles furchtbar ist. Ich glaube nur, dass wir momentan in Europa wirklich in einer Situation sind, wo, wo sich, dass sich die Lage wirklich verschlechtert hat, im Journalismus allgemein. Ich glaube auch, dass die Journalisten durchaus in die Pflicht genommen werden müssen. Ich glaube auch, dass es einfach so etwas wie ehrlichen Journalismus geben muss, das heißt nicht in investigativen, sondern in dem Sinn, in dem Sie das gesagt haben, dass Journalisten einfach ehrlich arbeiten müssen, auch wenn sie unter Druck sind und auch wenn die Zeit drängt und so weiter. Ich glaube, dass das eine Lösung ist und ich glaube auch, dass die Zivilgesellschaft sich viel lauter zu Wort melden muss, wenn, wenn Journalismus so unter Druck gerät, dass er nicht mehr ehrlich arbeiten kann. Um, just, just a sentence to where's the future? Do you know Media Power, the French media project? They have taken the decision we should have taken a decade ago. Educate the consumer, the reader, our clients, that our work is worth to pay for. That's what Media Power in France has achieved. I think they have now more than 60,000 sub subscribers for their online magazine, and the whole stuff is completely financed by the contributions of the readers. I think there is the future. We have to found new media, maybe in the, in the beginning, as a start with uh, capital from foundations, from charity, But in the end, we will have to educate our clients, our readers, to pay for our work. Otherwise, there will be no future for good journalism. Thank you very much.